to to join us. We're going to be getting started in just a moment. So I'm going to give everyone a chance to join. If you have questions throughout this presentation, please drop them in the Q&A or the chat. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. So I guess we can go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Kiana Leverett. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for Georgia Audubon. And this is our conservation career series where we shine a light on diverse career professionals in the conservation space and give them a chance to share their journey with you as to how they got to where they are. And today we're being joined by Crystal Mandika. She is the Director of Education and co-founder as well as the collections manager for the Amphibian Foundation. Now, if you like snakes, if you like all of the all of the things that are outside, you're gonna love and you're gonna love to hear this. So thank you for joining us, Crystal. Thank you so much, Kiana. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Um, so just to wanna give you guys a little uh, heads up on our technology situation here. Um, Kiana is gonna be sharing my uh, slides with us. Um, and so I'm just gonna give her a little nudge every time I need to have my slides changed. So uh, thank you, Kiana, for running my slides for me. Um, so just like Kiana said, my name is Crystal Mandika and I am a co-founder the Director of Education and Collections Manager at the Amphibian Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I've been the Director of Education for AF for the seven years our company has been running and Collections Manager for the past three years. So um, I wanted to give you a little background on me and how I got to where I am today. So I grew up in sunny Miami, Florida of course, Miami is known for its beaches and fashion trends, uh, art deco architecture, uh, and beautiful people. Um, I went to public schools, um, but schools that best fit my interests. Uh, I went to music school in elementary and middle school at South Miami K-8 Center and South Miami Middle School. And in uh, high school, I was able to pursue my academic interests at Miami Killian Senior High School. So these are all the schools that I grew up at. Um, growing up, I had a lot of interests, including music, law, government, and marine biology. Um, at different points in my life, I wanted to be different things, uh, probably not unlike most people. Um, at one point, I was sure I would be a marine biologist studying orca and great white sharks. Uh, when I was younger, my favorite time of year was actually Shark Week. Um, it was a time that I could learn about creatures that were fascinating to me in their natural habitat. Um, I loved the idea of learning the science behind their behavior. And I thought I might be able to be a scientist, but I was discouraged at how difficult science was for me when it came to like balancing equations and some of the more technical aspects of biology. Um, at another point, I only wanted to think about music and how much it inspired me to want to play all the time. Um, I identified as a musician. Um, music was something that I loved and, it, and a musician was something that I was. Um, I was never not singing. Uh, music completely soothed me and it was part of my life. But I wondered if that was all I wanted my life to be. I thought when I graduated from high school that I wanted to be a criminal defense attorney. I loved the law, all the ins and outs, all the rules of our government. I loved the idea of getting up in front of a jury to plead my client's case. Um, but in the pursuit of a career as a criminal defense attorney, I attended the University of Virginia. Uh, I imagined it would be the perfect place for me to learn as UVA had a great reputation for academics. But after searching my soul, I realized that I couldn't in good conscience defend guilty rapists and murderers, um, even though they have a right to a fair trial and an adequate defense. Um, so I left my university to pursue a career in music. 
I learned to play the acoustic guitar. I had already known how to play the piano and the violin. And uh, it was at this point in my life that I worked at Starbucks during the day and performed music on nights and weekends. So I would take my guitar and my amp and sing my heart out to my audiences. Um, I did this for 10 years. It was amazing, uh, enjoying the world of music. So I recorded demos, uh, performed live as much as I could. Uh, I performed at coffee shops, bars, art galleries, private events, festivals, and uh, made friends in the entertainment industry. But ultimately, I had a change of heart. I missed academics and wanted to go back to my love of law, politics, and philosophy. So I decided to go back to college to get my bachelor's degree in political philosophy at the New School University in New York City. Um, I thought I would have a career thinking about and talking about politics and how our government has come to be as it is. Um, I still didn't wanna be a criminal defense attorney, but I wanted to use my love of law somehow, in some way. Um, perhaps I could write books on my ideas about our political climate, um, or I could work on some news programs and tell people what I thought. Um, I was just, just excited to be a thinker. Um, I was proud to receive my bachelor's degree in political philosophy. Um, I felt like I had truly accomplished something uh, great for myself, and I still feel proud of that accomplishment today. Um, it was while I was on this political philosophy track that I met my now husband, Mark Mandika. Um, he was completing his master's degree in biology and had some amazing amphibians and reptiles in his home on display, which were amazing. Um, it was then that I was truly introduced to the world of amphibians and reptiles. I had heard about amphibians and reptiles before, but this was my first real encounter with them. Uh, growing up in Miami, I actually wasn't exposed to many native amphibians or reptiles. In fact, um, Miami no longer has any native amphibians, fun fact, and few native reptiles. Um, in my youth, I had only heard of frogs, toads, turtles, lizards, and snakes, and I had no clue that salamanders or Sicilians even existed. So it's kind of embarrassing to say, but it wasn't until my late 20s that I learned about their existence. Um, so Mark and I were married and we continued his hobby, which became our hobby of herp collecting. And so we had a lot of different species of amphibians and reptiles at home that we enjoyed and our children enjoyed as well. Um, so our two kids enjoyed growing up in a household full of life. And we all loved having amphibians and reptiles as part of our family. As the years went by, um, our animal collection grew and grew. Um, it was then that my interest actually shifted from pursuing a career in political philosophy to a career in amphibian and reptile education. Um, it occurred to me that we should be doing something meaningful with our amphibian and reptile collection. So we created our amphibian and reptile summer camp for kids, Critter Camp. So at Critter Camp, we introduced kids ages 6 to 14 to the world of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, we teach them about biology, ecology, and conservation of these important animals. Uh, but before starting Critter Camp, I had very little knowledge about amphibians and reptiles, um, but I realized that I was really fascinated by them and wanted to learn everything I could about them uh, so I could teach. So I studied, asked questions, and learned as much as I possibly could in order to then be able to share it with the children in our camp. So every day of our five-day camp is devoted to learning about a different animal group. Uh, we spend time outdoors as well, actually in the wild looking for animals. And that's probably like the most exciting part 
Uh, it's an amazing experience, especially for me when I'm able to put a salamander or snake into the hands of a child for the first time in their life. Um, the look of joy on their faces is what makes my career so special. This year, uh, we'll actually be celebrating our 10th year of Critter Camp, and we're so excited and grateful to have such a devoted community that supports us and our camp. So uh, it was partly due to the success of Critter Camp that Mark and I decided to take a chance on creating our own nonprofit dedicated to conserving, uh, conserving amphibians. Uh, the other part of the reason we decided to create the amphibians, the amphibian foundation is because amphibians are disappearing at a staggering rate and someone needed to address that. So 43% of the world's amphibians are either extinct, threatened, or in decline, which means that over 3,500 species of amphibians have already gone extinct. And that's a, just a staggering number. Um, at this time in our lives, Mark, my husband, was working at the Atlanta Botanical Garden. He worked in their amphibian conservation program for five years, caring for their endangered amphibians. Um, but sadly, uh, the Botanical Garden closed their amphibian conservation program in September of 2016, which left Mark without a job and many amphibians uncared for. Um, it was then that we decided that we couldn't let those amphibians go without care. And we started the Amphibian Foundation specifically for the preservation of one species in particular, the frosted flatwood salamander, which you see right here. Uh, so on September 5th, 2016, we started the Amphibian Foundation. And on August 9th, 2016, we brought frosted flatwood sal salamanders to our basement for the first time, which was actually the birthplace of the Amphibian Foundation our basement, just crazy. Uh, so we owe everything to the frosted flatwood salamander. Uh, so we made it our logo. Um, it's a frosted flatwood salamander in its larval form with those gills. So you can see those gills on that flatwood salamander right there. And then you can see our awesome logo that Mark created for us for the Amphibian Foundation. So um, at the Amphibian Foundation, our mission is dedicated to connecting individuals, communities, and organizations in order to create and implement lasting solutions to the global amphibian extinction crisis. Um, in these seven years that we've been a nonprofit, we've expanded our focus to several endangered species. So uh, now we do captive assurance colonies for species like the frosted flatwood salamander, the striped newt, which you also see here. Uh, and we head start and release into the wild hundreds of gopher frogs each year, which you can also see here. Uh, the Amphibian Foundation is different from most other nonprofits in that we do not rely on grant money to sustain us. Um, we realized early on that receiving grant money is unpredictable and unreliable. So we created our own model for sustaining our nonprofit. So everything we do is based around education. Uh, we are able to support AF's needs through our education programs. And this is where my director of education job comes into play. Um, so I'm responsible for all of our educational programs for kids ages 0 to 17. So not only do we provide our camp during the summer, but we also have educational programs throughout the year. Uh, we visit schools, participate in STEM and STEAM events. We have schools come to us for field trips. Uh, we host outdoor herping events. We attend local fairs, and we also provide individual and group classes. For kids ages zero to five and six to nine, we have our Critter Cafe, which you can see here, where kids learn alongside their parents. So it's parents and kids learning together. For our students ages six to 11, we have our Critter Class, where kids are able to learn more information about amphibians and reptiles. Then for our older students, 
ages 12 to 17. We have our junior and advanced junior master herpetologist programs. So this is where students get to have a deep dive into amphibians and reptiles. So we truly try to have a program for kids of all ages. Uh, but of course, we couldn't forget about the adults. So we also have many classes for our adult learners. And we have our suite of master herpetologist courses, which uh, includes our original master herpetologist program, Master Herp 2, the conservation edition, husbandry and captive management, and the Southeastern Master Herpetologist Program. And we also have our venomous handling certification course, which is really exciting. So people get to learn how to safely handle venomous snakes. Another program that we offer that I'm extremely proud of is our Conservation Research Bridge Program. So this program was created to help guide individuals who may be interested in amphibian conservation as a career. So our bridge program is geared toward individuals just graduating from high school, interested in conservation as a career, or individuals who may want to change their career to a conservation career. So everything we do at the Amphibian Foundation is based around animals, animal conservation, animal research, animal education, and the animals under our care all fall under one of these umbrellas. Um, next slide, Kiana. <laughs> uh, thanks. As director of education, I wanted to have a full understanding of the animals within our facility. So it just made sense to me to take on the role of collections manager. So as director of educate, well, so as collections manager, I'm responsible for 1000 amphibians and reptiles that reside at the Amphibian Foundation. So I manage their upkeep and care in our collections labs. Uh, we currently have 100 reptiles at AF. These 100 reptiles are all used for education. Uh, we use these reptiles to illustrate the biodiversity of animals on our planet. Uh, basically, reptiles are fascinating and uh, children gravitate towards them. So we like to include them in our education. Um, here is a shot coming up of our Venom Lab, which I happen to actually be in right now. Uh, if no one told you, you wouldn't know that there are actually nine venomous snakes in this enclosure in this room. We kind of keep them under wraps, um, but they're pretty amazing. And there are nine venomous snakes in this, in this area here. Uh, the remaining 900 animals that we care for at the Amphibian Foundation are amphibians. So like I mentioned earlier, we have our frosted flatwood salamanders, striped newts, and gopher frogs that we focus our conservation efforts on. But our other amphibians take part in breeding and research programs and our educational programs. And those amphibians live here in our amphibian lab, which is pictured here. And we strive to have a wide assortment of educational amphibians in our collection. Uh, we're proud to have native Georgia species as well as exotic species. Um, it's important to us for us to be able to teach our students and campers about animals that they can expect to find in their own backyards and how to conserve them in the wild. Um, it's important for us to be able to teach our audiences about the species they would also only be able to find abroad. Our educational, pro our educational amphibians include animals like uh, glass frogs, gopher frogs, and horn frogs. Um, we've also got, oh yep, awesome. Ahead. We can go to the next slide. So we've got our glass frogs, gopher frogs, and our horn frogs. And we've also got tiger salamanders, slimy salamanders, and emperor newts. Um, 
Some of our educational animals are also part of our breeding programs, like axolotls. Everybody loves axolotls. Uh, all of the axolotls that are pictured here were born at the Amphibian Foundation. We're so proud of them. Look at those sweet little babies. Uh, so when axolotls breed, on average, they can produce between 300 to 1,000 eggs. So last year, our breeding group of axolotls produced roughly 300 eggs, approximately 100 of which were fertile. And so we were able to rear 75 axolotl babies and we're so proud to be sharing them, our axolotl offspring with two universities. So Agnes Scott, uh, Agnes Scott College and the University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, and the wonderful thing about this is that it all comes full circle um, as the University of South Florida, specifically the Daban Biomechanics Lab, um, which has produced feeding videos for our edu educational programs in the past, will be doing more feeding research on these axolotls, which we've provided for them, which we will then in turn use to educate our audiences on the feeding mechanisms of these aquatic salamanders. It's just amazing. So it's all very rewarding and we can see the immediate return on our investment in that we're learning about these miraculous creatures that we're caring for. Um, so we've also had success breeding other species in our educational collection. Our Phyllobates batatis, or the gold Fiducian poison frog, um, they've bred several times for us. And we've just moved seven of our juveniles from our nursery to their adult enclosure. And eight more have just hatched from eggs and are tadpoles and have been added to our nursery. We've also reared one Nerurgus crocodus, which is our sweet little Azerbaijan newt, that little uh, spotted guy there on the left. Um, and that one individual is amazing and it's almost ready to be added to our adult enclosure. Our Telematobius culius or our Lake Titicaca frogs have bred for us. And we have our first clutch of tadpoles developing now, which is just so exciting. Uh, we've also just successfully bred our Agalignus calidrius or the red eye tree frog, which you can see up at the top there. We have currently 25 tadpoles developing, which is just amazing. And I can't wait for them to start developing their back legs and become little, little froglets. Uh, we've successfully bred the critically endangered Agalignus lemur or the lemur leaf frog, and we currently have three juveniles growing quite nicely in our amphibian lab, and that little guy is right in the middle on the bottom. And uh, because we must be doing something right, we have bred uh, in our, in our squamate lab as well, or our lizard and snake lab. So we've bred seven Europlatus, our giant leaf tail geckos, which you can see up at the top left. Um, they're currently about one year old uh, and they're growing so nicely. We're very proud of them. And we've also had success breeding our Coralophus ciliatus or our crested geckos. And we've actually raised and rehomed six beautiful crested gecko babies. So we're just really thrilled with all of our successes. Uh, but I couldn't end our list of successes without mentioning our breeding of our top priority species, our frosted flatwood salamander. On December 22nd of 2021, in our flatwood salamander lab at the Amphibian Foundation, we bred the frosted flatwood salamander for the first time ever in captivity. We're so proud. Um, it was everything we had ever hoped for. And it was really the whole reason that we began the Amphibian Foundation in the first place. And it was to conserve these salamanders. So uh, we've taken the first step in helping to bring them back from the brink of extinction. Um, so I have to say that all of these successes are not my successes alone. I'm proud to say that we have nearly 40 volunteers, five conservation research bridge students, 
and our conservation coordinator that come in weekly to help us care for our 1,000 creatures. Uh, we have a lot of mouths to feed and it can't be done by one person alone. So I'm extremely grateful for my team. When Mark and I were in high school, there really were no programs for us that explored conservation as a career option. So we wanted to give this next generation the chance to see what could be possible for them in conservation. Um, so thank you for listening to my journey. I certainly did not have a linear path to where I am in my conservation career today, but it was definitely an interesting path for sure. Um, so I would love to answer any question that anybody has and thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Crystal. <laughs> I feel like, I, I mean, I already knew you, but I do feel like I've learned some new things today. If anyone has questions for Crystal, please feel free to drop them in the chat or q and I can get us started because I have some questions. Awesome. Let's hear um, it. So my first one is, have any of the organisms that you've worked with kind of scared you? I know that some people, when they first interact with amphibians and reptiles, they may have an aversion because of something they saw on TV or what they've heard. So what helped you overcome that that mental roadblock and be able to actually work with these animals? That's a great question. So since I really didn't have very much background on either amphibians or reptiles, I didn't really have uh, an overall fear of either of them, which was kind of, kind of just convenient. Um, but from individual to individual, because every individual animal is going to be different, um, it kind of presented new challenges. So there was one time when we were presented with the opportunity to uh, invite a green anaconda into our and into our collection. <laughs> yes. And so Mark was, was telling me, hey, we've got this great opportunity to have a green anaconda added to our squamate lab or our lizard and snake lab. He's like, what do you think? And I was like, oh my gosh, a green anaconda? That just sounds so scary to me. It's like, I don't know if I can do it. So we went to the place that was offering us this green anaconda and they were like, okay, just, just hold them and see what you think. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to hold a green anaconda, this huge, enormous snake that could potentially just bite me and just cause so much pain to my life. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. Mark held the green anaconda first. I was like, okay, I, he didn't get bitten. So I'm going to be brave and try it also. So I grabbed him. He was amazing. And we decided that we would take this green anaconda into our collection and his name is Sylvester. He was actually in the slideshow that I showed you guys just a little while ago. Um, me just kind of holding this green anaconda. That was actually the first time that I had held him. Um, and it was amazing. And um, he's one of our biggest ambassador animals. Um, so everybody loves snakes. Well, some people like snakes and a lot of people are afraid of snakes, but he is one of the most amazing, calm, sweet snakes that I've ever met in my life. He's never bitten anybody. He's never struck any time. And so he's just a wonderful ambassador animal to show people that they don't have to be afraid of an animal, even as large as a green anaconda, something that in the wild, most people would be afraid of. So um, I think to get over that mental block, I just kind of had to kind of step outside my comfort zone just a little bit and, you know, and just try to hold an individual that I wasn't really sure about, but ended up proving was the perfect individual for us to have. Awesome. I, I too would love to hold an anaconda. I might like squeal a little bit, but I feel like I can handle it. Come on um, over. I'll, I'll put Sylvester right in your hands. Yes, let's do it. My <laughs> my next question has to do more with the the natives that we see here in Georgia. So for someone, if someone sees a snake or a frog or a salamander in their area, in their community, what should they do? That's a great question. So um, I am a big advocate for um, 
observing and appreciating nature um, when you're out in the wild, that's the best time to do it. So you have access to everything, the sights and sounds around you of nature. Um, I would encourage everyone to just enjoy what you're seeing right there in the moment. If you've got a, a phone with you or a camera, snap a photo, take a video, um, things of that nature. But in general, I would say, let's leave the life where we see it in its natural habitat. Um, just enjoy it from a distance. So um, amphibians are very susceptible to um, to different things in the environment. So their skin is what we call semi-permeable. So that means that a lot of uh, things can pass through their skin. And so when we're touching an amphibian with our bare hands, we're putting our own oils, our own germs on that amphibian, and that amphibian is going to absorb it into their skin. And so if we are not out in the fields with you know, nitrile gloves, ready to be very scientific about the whole process, uh, if we pick up that frog, if we pick up that salamander, they're going to get a lot of things into their bodies that they don't actually need and that can be really detrimental to them. So um, it's best to observe from a distance, snap that photo, take a video, um, enjoy it in the moment and kind of step away and let it be happy in its natural environment. I would say the same thing for any um, reptiles that you see in the wild as well. We've got snapping turtles that are native to Georgia. Um, they have a notorious uh, reputation for being um, not very friendly. So you'll probably wanna steer clear of their mouths if you ever happen to see a snapping turtle in the wild. Um, but they're also amazing to see. So you'll want to take that picture, take that video. The same thing for our snakes. There are several different species of snakes that you'll find here in Georgia. Um, our sweet little brown decay snakes that are so sweet. And sometimes you'll find a, a ring-necked snake as well. Um, but then at the same time, we do have copperhead snakes and we do have cotton mounts. Um, so we've got venomous snakes that are out there. So if you're not um, well versed in the species of snakes that you come across, you're going to want to give all of the snake species that you come across their, um, their space just to make sure that you stay safe and that animal stays safe, stay safe as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I do have one more question and it's more has to do with the job itself. So I know that you do a lot of education programs, but you mentioned that a lot of the work you do has to center around your lab where you keep your amphibians. So what are some of the skills or some of the things that you have to keep in mind when you are working with animals in a lab? Yeah, um, there are so many different things to consider. Um, the first thing to consider is biosecurity. So um, we have different levels of biosecurity in different labs based on the species that are in that lab. So we have like our flatwood salamanders, our frosted flatwood salamanders, our top priority species. They have the highest level of biosecurity that we have at the Amphibian Foundation. So if you are going to work in the frosted flatwood salamander lab, um, that is the only lab that you can go into that day um, before going into another lab. So let's say you needed to grab deli cups out of the striped newt lab, you would not be able to go into the striped newt lab and then go into the frosted flatwood salamander lab because there could be pathogens in that striped newt lab that could transfer to our frosted flatwood salamanders and potentially be really detrimental to our colony. So um, the first thing is um, just maintaining our proper level of bios security, making sure that we're not bringing pathogens into certain labs that can then spread and then basically um, just kind of level out our entire colony. So we're making sure that we are taking the right steps, going into the laboratories at the right times. And then when we're in those labs, um, not using the same utensils in different enclosures. So if we have tongs that we're using to feed one animal, we're not gonna go then and then use the same tongs 
could then feed another animal. Um, so we just have to be very concerned about maintaining um, just it's our own enclosure with its own biosecurity in and of itself, just to make sure that each individual enclosure is very safe at all times. Awesome. Thank you. If anyone yeah. has any questions for Crystal that you think of after this presentation, please feel free to email them to me or directly to Crystal at crystal at amphibianfoundation.org. My final question for you is if you could give any advice to your younger self, yourself who was in middle school and elementary school and high school about how to get to where you are now or something you would say, what would you say to yourself? I would definitely try to take it a little easier on myself. I think that I, um, uh, I'm a perfectionist, so I like things to be just so. Um, and so as I was growing up, you know, when I thought I wanted to be a lawyer or I wanted to be a marine biologist, there were so many different things that I had in mind. And I kind of beat myself up for for having so many different interests. You know, like, why do I have so many interests? Why don't I just have one main interest that drives me? you know, and I kind of beat myself up about that. But I think that the interests that we have um, make us who we are. And so the fact that I love the law and I love government and political philosophy kind of just works hand in hand with what I do now, even though I'm not, you know, writing papers every day, but it helps me in my communication and creating presentations for my educational classes. So I have to know um, the right ways to convey information so that people can understand what I'm trying to say. Um, so these are the things that I've kind of learned growing up and I realized that it was okay for me to be interested in a lot of different things because it has made me this, you know, well-rounded individual that is interested in lots of different things and, and that's okay. And, you know, take it easy on yourself. Um, be open to what interests you. Don't shut down any avenue. Um, you know, just be open to what comes and, and be open to the challenges that are presented to you. So yeah, that's my advice to my younger self. Awesome. That's wonderful advice. Thank you. I, I want to thank everyone that came and joined us today for our conservation careers program with Crystal Mandika. If you, again, if you have questions for her, please email her directly at crystal at Anthemian Foundation and be sure to visit their website and check out all of the amazing programs that they have going on for youth and for adults. I hope that everyone can join us for our next program next week as we are going to be joined by Anna Marie and Gala Bay with the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. So with that, thank you so much, Crystal, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye, Kiara. Bye.